This is not an easy video for me to make. I actually have been putting off doing this video for weeks because I didn't know how to tell this story. A few weeks ago, I went down to Ecuador for a shamanic plant medicine retreat. And while I was there, I pretty much died. So let me take this back a step. If we haven't met before, I'm Kay. I'm the creator of this YouTube channel, Ecstatic Self. And please do take a moment to hit that subscribe button below along with the bell next to it to be notified about upcoming videos. If you have been watching my YouTube channel regularly, you know that for many months now, I have been having the experience of sensing my impending death. Starting back in about January of this year, I began to tell people, I feel like I'm about to die. Like, don't get me wrong, I love my life. I'm happy to be here. This isn't me saying I want to kick the bucket. It's me saying I feel like my time is up. Over the course of my life, I've spent a lot of work on self-healing and really examining why I do what I do and trying to have meaningful experiences. And I had reached this profound point of feeling like I had just achieved what I had meant to do in this lifetime. Like I had reached all my goals, had the experiences I'd wanted to have, and felt a sense of accomplishment and completion in all of that. And that may sound really strange given the fact that I'm only 34 years old, 33 years old a few months ago when I was having these feelings, but I really felt like, hey, I came here and did what I needed to do and now I'm kind of ready to go. To which, of course, my husband obviously freaked out. He's like, no, you're not going anywhere. You still have a long life ahead of you. I need you, the world needs you, like you, you're staying put. But I'm like, I don't know. I, I really think like I might go. Like, I, I will not be surprised if I just suddenly pff, keel over and die sometime soon. And that feeling continued on for weeks and weeks and weeks and it kept getting stronger and stronger. At one point I even said to my husband, hey, this house we're renovating together, I kind of feel like this might be my last gift for you. I really feel like things are coming to an end. Now, during this point as well, I had begun to feel the need, not just a want, but a strong need, a pull, that I absolutely had to go on a spiritual retreat. Now, you may or may not know that I spent seven years of my life living in an ashram when I was younger, so spiritual retreat is not a foreign experience to me. But this time I didn't really know what it was meant to look like. Like, I didn't think it was necessarily going on a meditation retreat. It really felt like I needed to leave the world that I was used to. I had these images of me like backpacking cross country or just leaving the house without money, a credit card, food, just a backpack full of clothes and just kind of wander and be like, mm, things are gonna work out. I'll find a place to stay, I'll hitchhike, I'll just make my way across the country. Which ultimately didn't sound very safe to me and people were saying, please, please don't do that. Don't just wander out of your house and trust that you're gonna be provided for. Like I'm a very blessed and lucky person, but let, let's not push it. So I really didn't know what it would look like, but I knew that I needed to go and that there was some sort of major transition coming up for me. Now in my life coaching practice, I'm often getting the opportunity to meet and talk with and consult with wonderful individuals from around the world, around the country. And someone had reached out to me for a consultation call. And over the course of the call, I just had this really strong feeling and I said to him, hey, I, this just keeps coming up for me. I don't think this is just a call where I'm meant to offer you something. I really think that I'm supposed to get something in return. So would you tell me a little bit more about your life and your journey? And lo and behold, this ended up being somebody who had gone down to South America numerous times to study with shamans, had done shamanic training himself, and he began to tell me about the plant medicines, ayahuasca, and San Pedro. Now, in my life, I have generally been a fairly sober, reserved, person like I don't like the experience of being drunk I've gotten high on pot once like I'm I'm kind of boring when it comes to that department so going down to South America and taking hallucinogens wasn't exactly on the top of my list of experiences that I was eager for but as he told me more and told me how ayahuasca is a connection to the mother goddess and San Pedro is a connection to the father god deity, and that these weren't just dormant chemicals you were imbibing, but living entities, that it's truly a sentient medicine that goes into you and helps you heal and connect with your deepest and most deatific or most spiritual enlightened self. As he talked to me about these things, I turned within, asked my spirit guides if this would be something that was right for me, and the answer I heard was, yes, absolutely yes. 
Something else you might not know about me is that once I feel really good about a decision or something I really want to do, I tend to move pretty damn fast. So that night I began researching online about ayahuasca and San Pedro and retreats and where to go and do I want to go to Costa Rica or Ecuador or Peru and I found a couple places that were really well reviewed and got really great feedback online. So I reached out to a few of them but either they were way too expensive or didn't have availability for the upcoming like month or two which is I, I wanted to go right away like it felt like I needed to go that this death was happening. My call to retreat was I had to go now. A few other places I reached out to didn't even return my calls or emails. So a day or two goes by and I end up finding this place in Ecuador that has a retreat that starts in like eight days that has availability, is at a good price, and as I'm reading about the shaman named Santiago and his wife named Jimena who run this retreat center, I just had a really good feeling about them and their vibe and everything that they were offering. I reached out, I shared a little bit about myself, they said yeah absolutely come, you're not on medicine because if you're taking psychoactive medicine you have to uh, wean yourself off for at least a month before you come down so I was good there. I already eat a pretty pure diet so again good there so I started my fast, booked my plane tickets and about a little over a week later I was boarding my first of three planes to get to a small town in Ecuador called Yucabamba. So I'm on my way to Ecuador, I'm in uh, United Lounge at O'Hare Airport, the first leg of my three flight journey. And it's been a really special past few days as I've been energetically getting prepared for this trip. I've just been feeling a tremendous amount of opening and cleansing and a feeling of really beautiful vibratory experience. Like I really, I've heard that Mother Ayahuasca starts working in you as soon as you make that commitment long before you even show up. And I've definitely been having that experience of feeling an energetic shift. It felt a lot like a part of me was dying, uh, that I was being called on spiritual retreat. And it feels so right for me to be doing this, that when I imagine what it would be like if I weren't taking this trip right now, it really feels uncomfortable, like I'm missing, like I'm missing something like you, you have to go now, you have to go through this spiritual experience, you have to go through this death and rebirth and come through a new man. So it feels very, very right. I've been having just beautiful meditations, beautiful energetic shifts. I've definitely been stepping more into my power as a healer and a spiritual being. So I'm really excited to see how this journey unfolds. I feel so blessed that I have the opportunity to go to this retreat. Hopefully this will serve as some sort of benefit to you in your own spiritual journey of working towards ecstatic living and coming into wholeness. Now, a little bit more about plant medicine. In the Andean tradition, there are these master plants that have been received either by divinity or some believe by <laughs> aliens in times past who said, we are giving you these plants because at some point in the future, you will need them to heal, to reach the stars, to reconnect and remember who you really are. And I heard these amazing stories of healing from people while I was down there about learning to walk again after being paraplegic, of being cured of cancer, of being cured of emotional problems and addiction. These truly are medicines. They're not just a, a psychoactive plant that you consume and go on a trip and then come back and you're like, that was fun. No, these, these are truly profound healing things for your soul, for your body, and for your mind. It's 2 a.m., landed in Ecuador, now I've got a three hour layover until my next domestic flight. I'm sleepy, slept a little bit on the plane, but I'm um, just mainly excited for this adventure. Just feeling a lot of blessings and a lot of light. I'm so pleased to be here. So after these flights, after a very long and harrowing taxi ride up the mountains that made me and my uh, companion almost vomit, we arrived at this amazingly beautiful retreat center called Casa del Sol. And just upon arrival, I could just feel how special and spiritual the energy was. I signed up for an 11 day retreat. There were nine others of us on this adventure together. Uh, mostly younger people, 20s. Uh, there were some in their 30s, 40s. Everyone came for a different reason. Some just to explore, some to better know themselves. But for me, I knew that I needed, I needed 
to be in a deep state of spiritual reflection and growth and he healing. Like I, I just knew that something major was coming and I felt it in a way that I had never felt previously in my life. And that feeling of death was still there. So I just got in, I'm very wet. The last two and a half hours was a sacred sweat lodge. I don't handle heat very well, so this is probably one of the things I was most intimidated by about this week. One of the profound things that this facilitator, Jimena, said to me when I arrived, because uh, I think she could sense, she's very energetically aware, she could sense that I have a tendency to process on my own and kind of be in my experience by myself. She said, remember that these people you're here with are also your medicine. It's a very special time, it's a very special space that brought you all together. So you're here to learn from one another. And I'm so grateful she said that to me. We were there right at the time of the summer solstice, which creates a gateway in the heavens. The most spiritual times of day are dawn and dusk because it's a point of transition. If you think of a pendulum swinging on a clock, for one brief moment, the pendulum is perfectly still before it changes directions. So too is it, the times of solstice, the sun, the earth, daylight, there's a type of stillness at the same way that from day to night, creates a gateway, so do these special solar events in the year. So it felt very sacred and special to get to be there at that particular time with this group of people. On the first day, we did a sweat lodge and I got to try rape for the first time. It's a ground form of tobacco that gets snorted up your nose. It's put into a long pipe, it's ground into a fine powder, and they bless you with it, and then they put it to your nostril, your ass to inhale. I was so dizzy, I had to grab hold of a tree to keep myself upright. I did never thought of tobacco as being a transportive kind of drug. I had, you know, had a little bit of an experience with it prior, but as soon as they shoot the tobacco up your nose, it was just like whew, fly up into the sky and then slam back down into earth, threw up nine times immediately after taking this rape. So we began with a great sense of purging. I wasn't expecting to throw up tonight. Um, I thought I was going to be waiting for that experience with the ayahuasca. In the sweat lodge, I met a little spirit animal that was there as part of my guide for the trip. I initially had a little bit of judgment against him because it was a little hedgehog and I was like, oh, can't I get something a little more powerful like a jaguar or a falcon or I got a hedgehog? But the more I thought about it, hedgehogs, they seem super cute, they seem super happy, they smile, yet they're super strong. They have these quills that protect them, that if a snake bites them, they aren't affected by the poison. And something special, one of the guides that I met down there that she said to me is that the most precious things in nature have thorns on them because they're protecting something very sweet. So it felt very, very special to have a little hedgehog guide show up for me that first day. Now, after purging, it's time for dinner. The next day, we were thrown right into a San Pedro ceremony. So San Pedro ceremony starts early in the morning, 7, 8 a.m., and goes for the entire day. During this time, you're fasting, you're not even drinking water, and you're in a deep experience of the self. The ceremony took place up high in the mountains in Amaloka, a sacred space with a sacred fire, where all of the elements, the directions, the earth, the sky were worshipped through different offerings, different fire ceremonies, and we were led on this experience by this amazing, amazing shaman Santiago who had been practicing for 30 some years at this point. And I've met a lot of healers and spirit guides and sages and swamis and monks over the years. I truly say he is one of the great healers I've met. I remember sitting there and just saying, I am so privileged to have such a beautiful soul helping to carry me through this next transition in my journey. And San Pedro is a really interesting plant medicine because you don't necessarily feel it starting. It comes on you like a soft hug and then an hour goes by and you're like, whoa, I'm having a really strong experience right now of this medicine. And for me, even before I took the medicine, even when I was fully sober, I was having these visual experiences of spirit showing up that when I made an offering on the altar, a plume of smoke erupted from a sage stick that wasn't lit. When I made an offering of cedar into the fire, shapes bloomed and danced in a way that said spirit was watching. And then when it came time to take the medicine, I embodied the goddess. 
she took over my body to the point that I did not believe I was a man anymore. I had long gray hair and viney old hands with long fingernails, and I had visions of myself surrounded by my students, and we were chanting and clapping and wild with ecstasy, and the goddess lived in me. And when Santiago called us one by one up to the cheetah skin to sit and ride the cheetah, and he worked with us in our healing journey one by one, I saw and felt him open my proverbial wings, and in that moment, I was healed. I didn't go there asking for a particular healing or feeling like I needed it, but right then and there, I knew that I had gone through the experience I needed to of healing in a really profound, deep, emotional, physical, spiritual way. We came down the mountain, had dinner, and continued to remain on our spiritual journey for several more hours until probably the middle of the night when I finally came back to feeling fully sober. The next day was our ayahuasca journey, and ayahuasca takes place overnight. So we began around 8 p.m. and it went all night long, just past sunrise. So it is early in the morning. I have been up all night. We started our ayahuasca ceremony, went all evening, and I felt like I changed and grew in that. It truly is medicine. They keep calling it medicine. It gave me what I needed. And ayahuasca is a connection to the mother and she's also a connection to dreams. She takes you into this space where you're not fully awake and you're not fully dreaming, but you go on a bit of a voyage there. Our facilitator for our ayahuasca said that if you come in with a very pure state, all you'll see are beautiful shifting shapes and colors. And that ended up being more or less my experience that first night. It was like laying down and seeing these beautiful stained glass panels shift around me. More interesting than that, I ended up having a first conversation with my spirit guides. And my spirit guides challenged me. They said, who are you to teach when you are selfish? And I said, yes, I am sometimes selfish. And if that limits my ability of who or how I can serve, then that's okay. I'll serve in whatever ways I'm allowed to, even if it's more menial. And I'll continue to grow and evolve, but I am sometimes selfish. And I also know that there are no perfect teachers, perfect guides, perfect healers, that we all just do the best we can. And my guide said to me, who are you to teach when you are lazy? And to this I said, I don't know if I am lazy. For many years in my life, I got up every morning at 4.30 a.m. to meditate for three hours. I have proven to myself I can do that for extended periods of time. So yeah, maybe now I maybe sleep in a little later or sometimes meditate sitting in bed or lying down instead of in a formal posture in my meditation space, but my body's worn out. It's depleted. I'm trying to take care of myself as best as I can. My guide said, very good. We were testing you. And now we open the door for you into the great beyond. And I'll be honest, I was expecting something like amazing, like, okay, what's happening? And I felt something open and then nothing all that much really changed. And to be fair, I also recognized in that moment and upon reflecting later that I've heard from great spiritual teachers that sometimes you'll have a big opening, but it doesn't fully take effect or you don't really fully feel it until later, until your body has time to acclimate to it. And after this opening occurred and I didn't really feel much of a change, I said to my spirit guides, I said, well, where is God? Where is she? I came here to meet her and well, she hasn't shown up. And my spirit guide said, well, where does God most exist? And I said, in my heart, in anyone's heart, God dwells in the heart. And they said, well, then why aren't you looking there? So I turned my focus to my heart and it was an explosion of gold. The next day, we were doing San Pedro, but this time not in a sacred space of a temple, but in the sacred space of nature. Jimena led this adventure and she took us on a hike up these beautiful Andes mountains and across and then back down, a hike that would take all day. And we began by sitting and making offerings and having a short ceremony before this portal of trees at the base of the mountains and taking our medicine. And for most of the hike up the mountain, I didn't feel particularly um, traveling. Like I, my level of an unusual energetic psychic experience was lower, like a level two or three. I, I didn't feel high very much. But what I did feel was a tremendous connection to my heart. I felt the energy of love to such an intensity that my heart felt like it was going to burst. And more than that, I felt love as a force that penetrates time and space and geography. I felt my grandmother there with me and had conversations with her and felt how her love is still there 
physically there even though she's dead. I felt the love of my husband and felt him there beside me even though he was thousands of miles away. And I even felt love for the people who hurt me most. My teacher, his wife, and the woman who ran the meditation center I lived at from when I was a part of the ashram. These people who had abandoned me and thrown me out for really shitty reasons. And I had felt some hate towards and felt some grudges towards, but I felt those feelings blowing away like clouds of smoke and instead I just felt love for them. I felt gratitude for them. I felt so much love that because they did those horrible things to me, because they threw me out so unceremoniously and so unjustly, it brought me to this point. Had I stayed, I would have never had this. So thank you. Thank you for doing that to me. Thank you for all you've given me. Thank you for all the good stuff you gave me before that too. But I feel and dwell in love for you now. But I'm continuing up the mountain, again, not feeling terribly high, but having this profound experience of love. And then we get to the very top of the mountain to sit down and to make an offering to the earth where Jimena was building this beautiful mandala, this beautiful shape of flowers and seeds and colored candles and offering chants and tobacco, this beautiful, beautiful ceremony. But as we all sat down to get ready for that, I hit the ground and my level of being huh, on an energetic journey of, uh, of being high, whatever you want to call it, went from a level two to a level 15. Immediately, I was yanked out of my body. And surrounding me, I saw all the parts of my life that made up my identity. I saw my childhood, my years as a professional actor, my relationship with my husband, my years in the ashram, my years as a coach, my relationship to my family. And from each of these things arrayed out around me, a single thread of golden light traveled down into the base of my pelvis and then created a column of gold that traveled up into the heavens onto which I was rising. And in that moment, I knew I was dying. I knew this is what I had come here for, that sense that I had been having for months and months. It was time for me to die. Somehow I had cell reception there, so I'm like texting my husband like, oh my god, it's happening, I'm transitioning, the, my experience I was waiting for, it's happening, I'm taking you with me. And I felt that, I felt like energetically, I'm like, I'm ready to let everything go, but my husband, you're coming with me! And together we ascended up into the clouds. I saw this dark point that almost felt like a cervix appear before me, and it said, are you ready to go through? And I said, yeah. I stopped breathing, everything in me compressed, and I went through that black point and left this planet. And at that moment, a stormy sky where there had been no rain and no thunder and lightning, cracks of thunder sounded twice like cannon fire.